Hi, I am Becky Hill and welcome to my series two of my baby, my podcast, The Art of Rave. This podcast is all about dance music and its culture, where I will be talking to hand-picked dance music legends to discuss their music, their careers, their influence on the scene and how rave has changed over the years. I have asked my guests to bring these three tracks with them that mean or say something to them. It could be an artist that has influenced them, a beat that has changed them, or a record that reminds them of a certain time or place. And I've bought my own track, which defines why they are my guest. This week, I am very, very excited to say that I am chatting with the legend that is Fatboy Slim, AKA Norman Cook. One of the original superstar DJs with a career spanning decades, Norman Cook has consistently pushed the boundaries of what's possible in the world of electronic music. From the early days of DJing at local Brighton clubs to headlining some of the world's most iconic music festivals, his journey and career has been nothing short of extraordinary. So sit back and relax and get ready as we dive into the life and legacy of Fatboy Slim. So we are with Fatboy Slim, AKA Norman Cook, and we are in your beautiful house in Brighton. Thank you so much for having us. And That's welcome. Right. Well, thanks for coming down. Welcome on series two of the podcast. Well, thanks for having us. Um, we, here we talk all things rave right. and specifically um, rave from way back when all the way up to now. And um, I did explain this to you, but I will explain again. But I was born in 1994, so I feel like by the time I was 18, half the clubs were closed, um, all the good drugs had gone, and um, we were left with whatever we we call rave now. And I always felt like we had missed... I had missed something, and I'd heard all of these amazing stories about um, raves and... Um, and parties and events and stuff. So I have set about making a podcast all about finding out um, about the golden days of rave. So I would really like to know, I would like to start from the very beginning and I would like to know how you grew up with music and um, what your relationship with music was when you were a kid and how it all started for you. I, I've always loved music. It always, something happened very, very young. I think I can probably nail it to a car journey. And I had a brother and a sister. There's five of us in a car. Car journeys could be very, very tetchy. Long car journeys could be very, very tetchy. Apart from when we sang. And my parents used to like love singing. And if there was a good song came on the radio, we'd all start singing. And then we'd take harmonies. And there were certain songs that we, as the five of us, we, we, it, and something happened when, in that little Ford Zodiac, five voices were blending in harmony. This kind of power came through me and, and, and emotion. And I just, that was what, what hooked me onto music. That thing of, of, I don't know, blending different voices and the sum of the parts becoming this wonderful, powerful noise that was uplifting and assertive and you know and uh yes yeah, so, so that got me into the idea of that i like music so that i always what age were you to be, around that time i would have been five or six i suppose wow and that's when you knew it was five like or six yeah when i started liking music moving your my, waters. But my parents had really really <laughs> dreadful taste in music right <laughs> So, uh, like what we're talking, like Kenny Ball and his jazz men, right. uh, right. Peter Paul and Mary. You won't know any of these. Peter Paul and Mary's were like they were like um, really um, sanitized versions of Bob Dylan songs, right? And um, yeah, so they weren't. That was much like inspiration. The Beatles were the only things that that there were, obviously the Beatles were around in the sixties when I was born, and um, we had a couple of Beatles records. But apart from that, there wasn't much. So, and then, you know, there was like David Bowie and the um, Roxy Music. And I, I grew up during that sort of glam rock era. But then when I was 14, when I was sort of coming of age, punk rock came along and then that, that's what I wanted. From then on, I didn't want to be a pop star anymore, but I did want, I wanted to make music. And there's, there was this whole thing of like, you don't have to be good at any, you know, you don't have to be particularly good at an instrument, just start a band. And so I did. Right. And so, yeah, so punk, <laughs> punk rock was a really big influence on me I in in the in the sort of sense of rebellion, independent record labels rather than these sort of dinosaur, you know, like there, there was, you know, we had kind of Yes and Pink Floyd and Rush and these sort of super bands and punk kind of 
said, rip all that up, you know, make in make cheap, cheaply made records and put them out yourself. And I like that kind of spirit and that kind of um uh yeah, spirit of mild rebellion. Yeah, and I suppose 14 is a great age for Yeah, upsetting your parents. Yes. I wanted music that that really offended my parents. Inane drivel was what my dad called it. <laughs> Yeah, mine was hard style and happy hardcore. Yeah, that must have but... really pissed them off. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's um, a, yeah, I mean, but it's, yeah, it's a kid. I think it's, it's the a, same thing. It's, it's the, the age, same thing. It? Yeah. And probably, you know, kids who grew up the fifth, in the 50s when they were listening to rock and roll were doing the same thing. So it's music to, to annoy your parents and to give yourself a feeling of rebellion, but a feeling of togetherness. Because uh, especially for punk rock, like at first there was, there was only a few of us. And so when you saw another punk, they were instantly your brother, you know. It was political as well, wasn't it, at the time? Yeah, it well, was... it was political in being apolitical. It was sort of about anarchy, rather, you know, we did. Yeah. The 70s were a pretty drab time for the country and there were strikes and power cuts and everything. So we were just yeah. like, oh, so, you know, forget politicians, we'll just make our own rules. Right, and that's why it felt like such a yeah. revolution in music, and when, and right? So when, when Acid House came on, there was a lot of uh, parallels between punk rock and Acid House. And th there was, a, and you know, and this in terms of fashion and stuff like that, it was like a, a revolution and the whole movement, and, yeah. and and again a feeling of togetherness and 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 connection with other people. If you saw somebody else who looked like they were a raver, like you know, you didn't, you'd go out and say hello to them. Well, that brings me nicely, actually, onto uh, here at Art of Rave. I like to I like to get my guests to choose three songs that mean something to them. Okay. And um, I think this brings us on very nicely to The Clash. Yeah. Um, Safe European Home. Why that record? Not, not the most obvious. There's millions of Clash records. The Clash had an enormous effect on me. They were kind of, for me, they were like the, the, the gods. And they shaped not only my musical education, but they taught me about, they talked about politics. They turned me on to a lot of new music. Also, just that album, Given Enough Row, uh, there was a time, time when I started going to gigs. I saw them up the road from here, Crawley Leisure Centre. And it's just, you know, those gigs you go to where you just come out of it like that. It's going, oh, my God, <laughs> this, is, this is it. This is what I want in my life. You know, I've never been so turned on. I've never been so excited. I've never been so uh, inspired, mo by, inspired it, suppose, yeah. by it. And, um, yeah, so The Clash always inspired me. But like I said, more than just the music, there was the politics and the way they mixed different cultures and brought, and brought different cultures together. So coming on to another tune we'll talk about later, the first time I saw Grandmaster Flash, mm -hmm. he was opening for The Clash. So they would, they would deliberately oh, have support bands who they thought were interesting rather than just, you know, like... Um, and so they would always pick their own support bands who were interested, and they, right. and they picked Grandmaster Flash, who absolutely bombed with most people because he was just playing. <laughs> it was rap music, and they were, this was punk rockers. But there was about ten of us down the front, absolutely who probably it. who probably <laughs> are all now you know well well known names in in dance music. Ten of us just at the front watching Grandmaster Flash going, "What the hell are you doing <laughs> with those turntables? And how do I get to do it?" All right, well, let's get it on. This is The Clash, Safe European Home, released in 1978. So what I would like to know next, following The Clash yeah. and following um, Safe European Home, I would like to know, so you talked about from the age of like eight, knowing you wanted to be some sort of rock star. Um, when did you feel like that had happened and where, how did you get to that point? Well, like I said, I, ch I changed the... Uh, the um... I changed the plan from being a pop star just to I want to make music. When right. punk came along, it, it, it was like, well, you don't have to be a great musician, just pick up an instrument. So I've played in various bands where I played drums in one band, then I became the singer, and then I was a guitarist in the next band. So it's just like, you just, whatever that band was lacking, it's like, oh, I'll do that. <laughs> I'll learn that. Give me two days. And so I was in various bands, but I was in a band with, uh, when I was at school with Paul Heaton. 
and it was a band called the Stomping Pom Frogs. Great and, name. Yeah, well, yeah. And we and Paul <laughs> wrote these brilliant songs, and that was the first time I thought, Christ, you could this you could actually this isn't just this childhood dream that you've had. You might actually be able to do this. And we felt like that in the Pom Frogs. But then I came down here to go to college and he moved up to Hull. So was this was this pre or post the House Martins? And what, what era of your life was that? Was that this around? Is pre, this is pre House Martins. Right. Okay. So you were DJing before yeah. you were playing the bass in yeah. a band. It's really funny because everybody, when I, the House Martins split, split up and I started making dance music, tons of people went, How did you get from House Martins to dance music? But you were in dance music. But everybody I knew said, Mm. How did you end up in the House Martins in the first (laughs) place? Because you don't like that kind of music. No, I was was always playing DJing and, um, uh, yeah, I was always DJing as a hobby. I used to do weddings and parties and that when I was uh, in sixth form. Right, so you when, mean, when what, I like came down 16, here, 16, 17, you yeah. were doing DJ, we were doing, and how, and and when when did you, how did you learn? Because it would have been it would have been vinyl turntables back then. Yeah. It's not like the easy CDJs that we have nowadays. Yeah. But um, how how did that come around? Were you were your parents on? Did they have turntables? How how did you get used to a turntable? It was my my uncle Dennis was a DJ. Right, and he was he was naughty Uncle Dennis. He was like the black sheep of the family, and basically, <laughs> I I hero worshipped him because of that. Right, and yeah, he'd been a DJ in the seventies. So when I expressed it, basically, it all started because I, I I was a, I was a vinyl junkie. Basically, I used to get invited to all the parties because I had the records, because there was no streaming or anything like that. You, if you wanted to hear the latest, the, you know, the best records at the party, of someone course. had to bring them. Mm-hmm. So I had this box of seven inch singles, which was like hot property so i'd get invited to the parties because i had the records but the records get destroyed because teenage parties there's like vomit and fag butts all over them at the end of the thing and they're lying all over the floor so, so one girl invited me to a party and said oh you know will you bring your records i'm like actually you know what they just they get completely knackered yeah and she said they're what? expensive she said what if my dad hires those like you know like double decks like a dj console and you're in charge of the records that way they won't get, you know, they'll be looked after. And I was like, yeah, it sounds like fun. So her dad hired a Citronic Thames 2 console um, and I DJed and something really, really fundamental happened that night. I realized I, was, I got such a kick. Basically, I got everybody dancing and I was playing my favorite records, making them dance showing off it was like oh this is this is for me so was this was this like was were you playing punk or had you transitioned from being 14 now you were 16 17 and had it because this is probably where i had my most influential music shift as well from the ages of 13 to 17 so were you was it punk vinyl that you were mixing in or had it had it kind of progressed into more dance music no it was like new wave right. ska which i suppose yeah, the clash was not quite in. punk it was like yeah it was sort of post punk um ska it wasn't like dance music as we know it yeah, that hadn't really been invented invented yeah it, that the only dance music in those days was disco and that uh, disco was a bit of a dirty word around the late 70s cuz you know, the, like the the Bee Gees were doing it, and so there was it no was a, mixing. What, it was a bit cheesy. Yeah, this guy was seen as quite cheesy, and punk was supposed to be a kind of a, a, a reaction to all that. And there was no mixing involved. You just put one record on and after it the other. If I was doing a wedding, I had to do a little, you know, go on the mic, do dedications and stuff like that. <laughs> and and that was kind of how I learned my chops DJing, pre any kind of mixing. There was no beat mixing or scratchy or anything like that until I saw Grand Master Flash. What happened was I went from the person who put one record on after another to one person who made one record blend into another, mixed into another, and then chopped bits of it up and made them sound different doing scratching and made DJing a performance and put a creativity into it beyond just playing one record after the other. And forgive me, is he American? Mixing, mixing. He's American, yeah. And do he you was know the, he which was part of America he's from? New York. Right, I did from think. The I did, he that, was the was original. A there, was a, there was a DJ called uh, DJ Cool Herc was the first person to start messing about with, with the breaks. Right, and Grandmaster Flash and was Grandmaster the one to really Bla- run with it. He, he took it and he was much better at it. And he 
But yeah, he would basically take two copies of the same record and extend the break, the, the drum break. And then he would get his mates to chat over it and that became rapping. And so he, and he was, yeah, they, they were absolute pioneers. And, um, and this record, Adventures of a Grandmaster Flash on the Wheels of Steel, was completely like no one had ever done that before. It's a record that's made out of seven other records. I listened to this before I came out, actually. You've chosen Adventures on the Wheels of Steel. Yeah. Um, and this was in 1981, which is incredibly early um, for this kind of uprising of, uh, as you say, dance music still yeah. hadn't really been invented. Um, and, and, it, and it, it wasn't a rap record. I mean, mo most of the Grandmaster Flash stuff, he would DJ and then he had five MCs. It's like seven minutes long as well. Yeah, it's seven a seven minute long, long but record. But it's not, it's, no, there's no rapping on it. It's just him chopping up other people's records, playing them on top of each other. So let's get it on. This is Grandmaster Flash Adventures on the Wheels of Steel, released in 1981. <laughs> You were about 18 at this point. You've just seen Grandmaster Flash. You're just about to get into a very successful band. You've all you've been DJing since you were 15, 16, and then you're in Brighton at this point. What did what did Brighton do for you? Was there I assume there was clubs here, um, but what did Brighton do for you in terms of how it shaped your career? Well, Brighton is uh, the nightclub capital of the south of England. Okay. We, I think, I think when I moved out to Brighton, we had there was more nightclubs per capita than any other city in the town. And what's it's it where everybody, now? it's where everybody from south of London comes at a weekend to go out. Uh, right. Where a lot of people from London, if they want a dirty weekend, come they over come to down. Brighton. So we we punched above our weight in nightclubs, which is great. Is it still the same now? I don't know. I'd have to. I'd have to. I'd have to re look at the census, but um, it's still very much a clubby city. It's also a very open-minded city. There's a huge gay population. Mm -hmm. That was shaped my musical education a lot because I used to hang around in the gay clubs because they they had the cool they had the cooler records in those days, and so it, yeah, it, it was, it was, and, and Brighton has always attracted eccentrics, ne'er do wells, lunatics, <laughs> creative types. Call them what you will. It kind of is a magnet for. For those kind of people, so uh, and yeah, which which is one of the many reasons why I love it and why why I live here. But very very thriving club culture. I used to go out six nights a week, uh, and in those days, yeah, they, there wasn't big events. It was all two three hundred um, capacity clubs, underground music, underground. Right. Each you know you could go to a, like an indie night one night, a goth night one night, a hip hop night <laughs> one night. And then weekends, it was just sort of generally held. But this is, you know, they hadn't invited, don't forget, in the, these days, they hadn't invented ecstasy yet. They hadn't invented house music yet. So then how did how did the House Martins come about? How did you start then, playing bass? So I finished college and then I kept in touch with Paul. We were, because obviously we were mates from school. I'd played on a few of their demos. But by, in the th three years that I was down here at college, he'd started this band called the House Martins. And they would ju they just got a record deal, but he fell out with the bass player um, just before their first ever tour. So he just rang me up and said, "Oh, can you fill in on bass?" Yeah, how could? Because how... I knew half of the songs from the from our previous band, and so oh, he, so he just... took s some songs from the Pom Frogs. In those days, he was still playing that a few he'd Pom. Yeah, yeah. And used them for the House Martins. Yeah. So he'd already knew the the bass lines and stuff for yeah. that. And then and I literally I, I literally went to see them in Kings Cross thinking I was going to see the band and there was a note saying when he arrives send him straight to the dressing room and he said right you've got 45 minutes can you how much of the set can you learn whoa, whoa, on bass whoa, whoa. you turned up thinking you were watching them yeah and I ended up playing <laughs> bass for them <laughs> how and did it, that go then well we only we only nailed about half the set so they played the first half of the set without a bass player and then they <laughs> right. in, then they introduced then they introduced me, 
and I went on stage, I walked on stage and I tripped on the top step, tried to grab the bass on my way down. So the bass falls on, I go flat on my face, bass goes Bong! on the stage. And Stan, the guitarist, just looked at me and went, nice start. <laughs> <laughs> then they took you on tour. Yeah, so then I went on tour and then things the the the, the things started taking off. We had a, I was I, well then I discovered how much fun it is driving around England in a in a comma van with five other blokes getting drunk every night and seeing <laughs> England. I mean, I never really travelled much around England. I was going to all these cities that I'd never been to before in my life and showing off every night for a living. And uh, yeah, I was like, "This is me. This is what I'm gonna do." How did the how did the band finish? And did you feel like you were a bit on your own? Like, was there a difference in success that you had with the House Martins to when you created the Fat Boy Slim persona and and uh, or brand and start doing it? Yeah. Doing that, did you feel like you had gone from the name in lights to to DJing in Weatherspoons? No. What happened was. The not that I I'm was suggesting still that you did day, DJ in Weatherspoons. I'd just like to make it clear at this point, I've never DJed in the Weatherspoons. <laughs> <in my life. laughs> they don't have music yeah. in Weatherspoons anyway. Sorry. Um, <laughs> no, what happened was while I was in the house buttons, dance music started getting on the radio and in the charts right. and getting props. And, and this all is what, the piece, and all the DJs that I used to play with started putting out records like Cold Cut, right? And Tim Simon and, and people like that. Then uh, Mark Moore and all these DJs that I used to play a DJ with, they were putting out records and having hits, and I was like, oh. So I was kind of torn. So we had musical differences with the band. So I started, Paul and um, Stan started writing songs, and I would normally do like the rhythm arrangement. And so I started putting drum machines and and uh, trying to hip hop it up, uh, which didn't go down well at all. <laughs> So we had the musical differences there. Okay, and, I see. And, but also I could just see the, you know, the people that I was mates with making music that I loved and 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 being in the chart. So uh, it right. just and but all of us, I mean, just all we we just came to the end of our rainbow. I mean, you know, Hugh didn't want it, didn't like being a pop star at all, so he left and then we all we all sort of fell out with each other. We went from this band of brothers who's like we'd go through hell together to we didn't want to be in the same room together. We only yeah, separate quite... dressing rooms, and so yeah. Oh, so it, I see. So it had all just right. fallen apart. But more importantly, the music that I'd always done for a hobby was now was becoming now, yeah. a profession. And you weren't really in love with the music at the house, Martin. Yeah. But it was the it was the journey of it all. Yeah. That was that was the thrill. And, but luckily, all the way through the house, Martin, I'd spent. I'd spent the money I'd made from the house audience buying 12 Technics 1200s and a mixer and a little port studio and a sampler and a drum machine. So, and I'd been making all these demos. So immediately the house might have up. I went into remixing and making my own dance tunes. Yeah, so obviously you have a have a song called Everybody Needs a 303. And, and at that point, were you... Were you working with other people and were you were you experimenting and, and did it feel quite creatively free yeah i think for it, there was a gradual process to start with beats international when i realized that rather than having a band you can just use a drum loop or you know rather than having a drummer you can use a drum loop freak power i used to make it all at home with samples and then get the band to play it live and there was always always this battle of like they wanted to play it's like why can't we play on the records it's like because the because the drum loop sounds better than you right and then right, right, right. I and so, but all these things were kind of leading up to Fatboy Slim. Is that, and now at the point when I started being Fatboy Slim, I realized A, I'm a better DJ than I'm a bass player, B, I'm a better producer than I am a songwriter, and uh, and C, more people want to see me DJ uh, than, than play in a band. And D, by now at this point, the kind of music we were making was a bit anarchic and a bit punk and a sort of a reaction to House had become a bit dull. So we were breaking really? laws. Yeah, we were, yeah. At the time I started Fatboy Slim, I had I was making House Records as Pizza Man and Mighty Dubcats. And were you but, working but, with other people with this? With, with no. these? It was just you, yeah. right, okay. 
And then, um, but house music we got a, got a bit boring. Like it was a bit handbaggy and a bit same. You know, the peak time of the early nineties had kind of come and gone, and and there was very few. But all the, all the records still started sounding the same, and right. there was a few of us who just kind of got a bit bored. So there was like me and the Chemical Brothers and Justin Robertson and John Carter. So you've got this bunch of people of a certain age who grew up listening to the Beatles, so they're like hooky pop music. Then they cut their teeth in punk rock, which was all about the musical revolution and being a bit uh, naughty. And then they like hip hop and then they like house. So when house got boring for us, we just looked back to the other bits. So basically you had the, the hook lines of, well, you had the, 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 the energy of acid house with the break beats from hip hop, with the, the, the do it yourself attitude of punk rock and the hooks from the Beatles. And it's that a was a very good of, mixture. That was a, uh, That's our well, big it was kind of the best bits of all the different eras of music that we'd grown up through. And that's what created Big Beat. That was pretty much the formula of Big Beat, yeah. From my point of view, dance music, and, and it would be really good to get your opinion on stuff. I've, I've, I have definitely, I've struggled through my career, I, I feel, and I've felt like I've had to very much fit into a, a mold or a narrative and and being experimental isn't as rewarded anymore. Like, especially with the music that I grow up, grew up on, which was, um, you know, songs like Right Here, Right Now and Basement Jacks and the Chemical Brothers group, like, raised me for a lot of it. And then we had trance music and then we had happy hardcore and then it was drum and bass. And then it was, you know, then my brother, my big brother was into hard style and French core and speed core. And, and then that got a little bit too quick. And then it came back to, you know, all of these subgenres of drum and bass, liquid, neurofunk. And, and it, it felt like muse dance music was progressive. Whereas now I don't feel like dance music, progressive experimental dance music is being as rewarded in the charts. And especially when you got into like, when things really started to kick off for you and your career and you had, you know, two or three, four, five incredible albums and, and massive chart singles. And what, right here, right now, went to that's fucking number two in the charts? A, I think that's a... That's incredible. That that's wouldn't quite happen important nowadays, thing, do you a think? Quite an important thing that I think you've said is whether it gets in, whether the experimental stuff gets in the charts or not. Because there are times there's waves. And I was really lucky because I hit it at, one, at a time when records that I was making, which didn't really sound like proper pop records, they were made in my bedroom out of other people's records and they were just... They were dirty and wrong and repetitive and yet I managed we managed to get them in the charts and maybe two years later uh, they would have been ignored so well yeah I think it comes in I kind I think that, that there's times when there's times when music becomes so homogenous that people that the whole public the whole public just like you we need something else this has got down now in the art of rave i always choose a record of oh, my right. guests um and I, I mentioned right here right now and i do want to play it i love this record and i was telling you about before we started recording that i did pete tong's i beat the classics for the last five years and this was i think the opening record that he would play with the orchestra and still to this day i can hear that record and be transported to the side of a stage at an arena and and see everybody losing their fucking minds for this well it's it's lovely that you played that because do you know the story about why i made that record? i actually don't know right so I read, I was reading one of the dance music magazines and they had a poll of what's the greatest dance music record of all time. And it was Massive Attack, Unfinished Sympathy. Great record. And I was like, yeah, that is a great record. That just stands above the others. And I, so I listened to it, I was thinking, what is it? Why is it, what makes it better than all the rest? And it was the strings. Mm -hmm. It was the way the strings, is such an emotive instrument, a string section. And I was thinking, that's what makes it, because that string section wasn't just a quick cheesy sample that really lifted the emotions of the song so i thought right i'm going to make a string based record so i got together all these little string sync samples that i had around on my discs and put them together and that became right here right now no way. so then to complete this journey 
to hear it played by an orchestra. I remember the first time Pete's orchestra played it on Radio 1 and I was like, oh my God. I want to get it on. This is Right Here, Right Now by Fatboy Slim. Okay, so we just heard right here, right now, by yourself, Fatboy Slim, um, aka Norman Cook, who is in on the Art of Rave podcast. So I would, I really want to know about Big Beat Boutique, and the reason why I want to know about that is because I feel like nights now are different, and event spaces are different, and clubs have closed all off, all all across the country, um, and I want to know what kind of movement Big Beat Boutique felt like. You started it with the Chemical Brothers, right? And a few no, others? no, no. Basically, the Chemical Brothers had a had a um, uh, a club called the Heavenly Social in London, and Lindy, who'd sung on um, Beats International, um, she lived in London. She phoned me up one day and said, "You know that kind of music that you play? That's kind of like sped up hip hop, slowed down acid house." You know? Well, there's these there's these people in London called the Chemical Brothers who are playing it too. You should come and see them. So I went up to the Heavenly Social and it was like meeting your long lost brothers. <laughs> it's like, wow, you get me think the same as me. So um, so I used to go out to, to uh, the uh, Heavenly Social every week and then used to and play that. So we just had the idea that rather than having to commute up to London every week, we'd start our own club. So the Big Beat Boutique was, was started by me, Damien, who, who then ran Skint Records, and uh, a guy, my flatmate called Gareth. And it oh, was, wow. but the whole idea of Big Beat was to break up, rip up the rule book, have a punk approach to dance music and go, it's got boring, let's try and change it. So we would play rock records in the middle of it and we would mess about and what became Big Beat. And, and it, was, it was great because there was only a few people who did it, like the Chemical Brothers, Monkey Mafia, and we became quite a tight knit gang. We would always play together and they would come down and play in Brighton and I would go out and play in London. And, but it was, that was when we realised something big was happening because every week the queue would get bigger and bigger. And, and the, the original Big Beat was, it was like a scout hut. It held like 300 people, had a really low ceiling. <laughs> it was used as a tea room. So it was right by the pier in, on, in, on, on the seafront. And they used to use it as a tea rooms in the afternoon. <laughs> And then turn it into, into a, a club in the club evening. Club in the evening, and the owner of the club would let us get away with murder. So we used to really mess about, and but it was like in my in my sort of romantic head, I felt it was like the Beatles playing at the Cavern Club. It's like something's happening here, and more and more people kept coming, and then journalists would come down, and you know Marianne Hobbs would come down. So one you week knew shit go, was happening then. We felt that something was happening. Yeah, we felt this is working what we're doing wow. and it seemed like the more rules we broke and the stupider we were the more people enjoyed it and did we, you did you upscale it how long did it how long did it go no, on well, for? the the original boutique they redeveloped that area right. and uh so then we we were homeless and we went moved to the concord too um but it was still quite a small club but it was like our clubhouse it was like where we it was like Skint Records Clubhouse and then we would invite people down from London and we'd be sharing ideas and we would have, you know, we'd invite, uh, we invited like um, Aphrodite. We don't kind of like the sort of jump up stuff. So he would come down. Aphrodite. He would come down and play and, and and Mick Jones from The Clash came down and played with the, Mick, with the big audio dynamite sound system. And it was, it was sort of quite experimental but it seemed like right. the more he messed around with the genre. Wow. The best it was, and the, but the thing was, the idea was to to break musical rules and put things in places where they shouldn't be, and mix different sorts of music they shouldn't do. And the sad thing was that, like many things like that, it became a formula. We wanted to break the formula, but then there became a big beat formula, right. which was you know the break beats with the you know, and um, but my, but my greatest my greatest pleasure out of all of it is if you think that house music is named after the Warehouse Club in Chicago. Garage music was named after the Paradise Garage in New York. Big Beat music was, was named, named after, after the that. Big Beat Boutique, no after way. our club. 
And you're trying to lead me on to Marvin Gaye, I am Gaye, trying aren't you? to lead you on to your, to I, your see, next I know, you, you Can, can you help me, You can please? lead me on to Marvin Gaye any day. I, I'm <laughs> quite happy to be led well, there. Well, because you mentioned yeah. that you use you sample this song. Um, no, I didn't sample it. I just quoted it. Oh, you quoted it for your live show. Yeah. And the live show is, the live. there's a section of your live show. There's a section right, right in the kind of the, the, like the money shot, the build of right here, right now. Um, we put up a big rainbow flag and just the big slogan, only love can conquer hate, which is a, a line from what's going on. And I just think it's a beautiful sentiment. It fits many, many situations. Yeah. Uh, it was quite a statement putting it over a rainbow flag um, initially, but it kind of works for what's going on in the Middle East right now. Of course. Um, and, yes, yeah, one size fits all. And Marvin Gaye for me was him and Stevie Wonder were the first people to put an inspiration into dance music. Dance music until then had been, you know, come on, everybody, let's do the Watusi or let's do the twist or, you know, let's all yeah. have fun. But the idea of, of making dance music that, that lifts your spirit or enlightens you in some way or inspires you in some way rather than just in terms of the music, having, having a good message, I think, is, uh, is, 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 is it's sort of rarer these days. And I try and do it. I mean, obviously, I'm not the world's biggest proponent of doing it. Though, I mean, things like right here, right now, it's quite can be quite stirring. Doesn't really mean anything. But yeah, it's more the emotion it, that that was in that track for sure. Apart from it having a out and out message, I guess. I, yeah, and but things like praise you. I mean, the lyrics of praise you. I I I think one of the reasons why it's endured so long is because they can mean anything. It can be about a relationship. Oh, there's so you much know, joy in that So record. many people have got married to that record. There's so much joy in that oh. record. I remember picking my big brother up from school. When I still hadn't, I was still in nursery and I remember picking my big brother up from school and that coming on the radio and us all singing. But you, but you could be, but 20 years later, you can be it's in still a completely it's, different situation. Absolutely. And then, and then you hear it again and it's like, oh, yeah, we have come along. Yeah. So, yeah, so it can be about relationships, be about obviously sport, a lot of, yeah. you know, my, my team, Brighton Hove Albion, we play at the end of every match, which is quite weird because the emotions of it, I'm either like, you know, we, we, we've just won. Oh, you're really sad like, about it. It's like, <laughs> God, you really have to play this you know, after we've Well, lost. I think we should get it on. And I think okay. um, I think this is a beautiful track. This is Marvin Gaye, What's Going On, released in 1971. It's a bit of a bugger, really, because I haven't even touched on Ibiza, you know, and 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 DJ culture over there. But I think I definitely feel like I've asked everything that I've wanted to ask and got out of what I've wanted to, apart from this question. And it's my my last and final question, really, is with your event, Big Beat Boutique, and how and how forward thinking and progressive that felt for you at the time with you at the head of it all. Have you seen, have you seen something in this day and age that resembles that feeling that you had back then? And what do you hope for, for dance music and events, event culture in the future? The closest thing I think I've seen recently has been Fred again, like doing, you know, like doing pop-up gigs in, in chip shops and then doing a pop-up gig at Madison Square Gardens a week later. And uh, and just and and again bringing different cultures together, you know, using music as well as rave, you know, using you know traditional music and the emotions of that, but also just the way he goes about it. He's quite he's quite a punk approach mm -hmm. of just like let's try this, and it's turning people on. One of the the main uh, reasons why dance music exists is to help us escape. It's, it's it's there to, for us to for a couple of hours on a Friday night to escape all our troubles and go off to this sexy fantasy land where anything is doable and everybody's beautiful, you know. And it's you know folk music was there to to you know to get a message across and and dance music is there just to have a, a release and people all, always want that release. Young people always want to go out and get high and get laid, and 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 it's a uh, dancing and 
communing and connecting through music is a great way to escape your troubles. So no matter what troubles there are in the world, we'll still be there to, you know, like just be that that little little release, just a way of letting off steam for a few hours. And I think on that note, that is the art of raves. That so is pretty much the art. Norman Cook, well, the, pur- the purpose of raves, shall we say. Absolutely. <laughs> it's made me want to go out now. <laughs> well, look, thank you so much no for worries. coming on and thank you everybody for listening. I have found this absolutely categorically fascinating and this has been something that I've wanted to 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 do for a very long time. So thank you so much for giving me your time. You, well, it, this has been amazing. Thanks so much for being interested and thank, and thank you for going, flying the flag. And, uh, yeah, thanks thanks for uh, kind of acknowledging what went before whilst you're doing what you do now. Um, it's, 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 a, it's a mission of mine to go and present Rave to people and to remind them of where, where Rave come, came from. So thank you so much. And um, thanks, everyone, for listening. This has been Excellent. an absolute honour. Thank you. Thank you.